Well, today, I think will be the, the last time I'm going to be up here giving a message. We have a Pastor K. Is that his name? Kendall. He'll be starting next Sunday. Uh, so before I get started on, on the message I have, I just want to recap a few things I've talked about over the last few weeks. One is getting involved. We're still looking for folks to get involved. So I know God is speaking in your head somewhere saying, hey, you could help with this. Hey, you've got this gift. You could do it. We need your help. There's a sign-up sheet in the back to help with children's education. We need some people to volunteer to help take care of the kids because that way we can make sure they understand the Word of God, but then they're also having a part of the service themselves so they can go upstairs and they can make a little craft or do a little project or something like that. Um, Bonnie talked about you know, the upcoming craft show and the chili cook-off. We need assistance with those kind of things. We need help with a lot of stuff. So everybody can get involved. Everybody needs to figure out a way to get involved and help out. The other thing is being invitational. How many people invited a guest this week? Okay, we really need to get every hand up in this church, not one or two or three. Because remember, people are not just going to walk through the doors. We could be a mega church up in North Canton right off of I-77. Folks aren't just walking off the street just to come in. Some do, not many. Most people come to church because someone took the time to personally invite them and say, please come to church with me. Sit with me through church. So we all need to do that. We all need to be invitational. So next week, sometime when I'm standing up front here, I'm going to ask who was invitational. I won't be doing a message, but I want to see more hands up. We all need to get more involved in all those different ways. So today what I want to talk about is turning the impossible around. Um, and it's going to be from Mark chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. And just to give, give you a, a lead-in into where we're going with the story, Jesus has left his disciples for a little bit to handle some stuff. When he's coming back, he notices there's a large crowd, and they're arguing. And it's mostly the disciples and the teachers of the law, or the scribes, are arguing. So this is where we're going to pick up. Uh, this is in Mark chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. So if you have your Bibles, you should have those out following along to make sure I'm reading the right things to you. So what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And then that's it for uh, the reading. Then we'll go on further with that a little bit later here. So as you can see, as soon as Jesus showed up, the spirit reacted and jumped out, of, started reacting within the boy. So even Satan and the demons believe in Jesus. We can all believe in Jesus. We need to have faith in Jesus. So one thing we can learn from this is God can turn around the most hopeless of situations. This morning, is there something in your life that looks hopeless? There's no way out and impossible for you. Well, I have good news for you. All things are possible for people who simply believe that God will show up on their behalf. How do you do the impossible? Well, to someone who has never made Jesus the Lord of his life, that would seem like a peculiar question. Natural people, people who live under the dictate of this world's systems, never think about such things. In their minds, the impossible is simply that. It's impossible. But if you're a believer, 
you know what it's like to ask that question, not just once, but again and again. You know what it's like for the Spirit of God to present you with a challenge so far beyond your ability that you can't even imagine how to meet it. Let's think about some of these points for a moment. All things are possible for the person who has faith in God. As Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. Focusing our attention on God so that all we can see is Him, then we will see our impossible situations turn around. The believer can accomplish the impossible through Christ Jesus. We must be single focused. All of our attention must be on God, His plan, and His will for your life. We can't afford to vary off that course. Whatever you have the faith to believe for, God can do it. We need to become Christ minded and see the end results. The results you experience are based upon the amount of faith you have in accomplishing the impossible. God will turn your impossible situations around if you will just believe him. Tithing and giving offerings unto God is an act of faith and trust in the Lord. So those are all kind of little thoughts just to keep in your mind about how can we take the impossible and make it possible. I'm sure that most of us would prefer to live in the mountaintops of the spiritual highs of our lives. Those times when God is moving in powerful ways, your confidence is high, you have that positive can-do attitude, your relationship with God is passionate, there's excitement in the air, and you have this bold persona of bring it on. Looks impossible, but it's no problem. Don't you love those times? But isn't it hard to stay on top of that mountain? I know it is for me. As the song goes, there's got to be a little rain sometimes. To get to the next mountaintop, we have to come off the one that we're on and go into the valley and work our way up to the other side. It's the valleys we don't like. It's those times when it's dark and we can't see, when fear creeps in, when it's long and discouraging and beyond our human ability to cope, that's when we begin to struggle. But this is the time we need to completely put our faith and trust in God to do the impossible. Let's think back to our passage. I bet the teachers of the law who were arguing with the disciples were disputing over things of some substance when Jesus came on the scene and asked what they were arguing about. But here is really where the story begins to unfold. The father speaks up about his son who is possessed and that he had asked Jesus' disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. It must have been very embarrassing for the disciples to be so powerless in the face of their detractors. They were unable to free this boy from the demonic grip in his life. They believed they could and had done it before with others, but now they couldn't. The paralyzing force of doubt had crept in and it was like a fire hydrant, distinguishing their faith, making it seem impossible. Jesus sort of chastises his disciples, saying, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Unbelief has no power. Jesus' disciples had failed. He had chosen them, trained them, gave them authority over the powers of darkness, gave them personal experience, and when he was gone for just a little while, they fumbled the ball. Fear, failure, unbelief, it can all lead to viewing the impossible as impossible. Jesus still comes to confront us in our unbelief. He comes grieving that we have such little spiritual power and victory. Unbelief cannot succeed against Satan. Unbelief does not and cannot please God. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him 
must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Please believe me, times of testing will always come. They are opportunities of faith. How can we say we have faith when we have blue skies and a warm breeze? How can we say we have faith when everything is going our way? It is only when we can't see, when we don't know how things are going to unfold, when things are really looking bad, when all we can see is the impossible, that we find the real substance of our faith. It is only in those times when it's beyond our own abilities that we can truly measure our faith. I really don't know why the disciples came up short. Perhaps they'd gotten too busy with ministering to others. Maybe they thought because they were with Jesus so much that they really didn't need to pray. Not only did this power failure affect their own spiritual lives, it affected their ability to minister to those around them. Later on in the same chapter in verses 28 and 29, the story continues. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And there again, they're talking about the evil spirit that was inside the boy. And he replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. So some versions of the Bible say prayer and fasting. But notice, however, Jesus didn't say, I'm the only one who can handle this kind of situation. Or if you only had said the right words. Or only seminary trained people can handle things like this. He said that their power failure was a direct result of their prayer failure. So let me ask you, have you ever experienced a spiritual power failure in your life? Have you ever felt powerless against temptation? Have you ever wondered, where's the power? Well, you're not alone. Great men of God throughout history have had high and low points in regards to their faith. Times of anguish having doubts even about God. Like Jacob, Job, David, Jeremiah, Thomas, probably the most famous of all, the doubting Thomas, Peter, etc. People who questioned, faltered, doubted, and yet in the end, they still remained faithful. Through God, all things are possible. At this point in my life, I'm closer to God than I probably ever have been. I truly believe that through God, all things are possible. Yet, at the same time, I've never been so aware of my own spiritual shortcomings. I struggle with my powerlessness and lack of faith at times. I struggle with turning total control of everything in my life over to God. I still have a lot of growing to do. I believe there are also times of doubt, and I struggle as to why that is. So let's return back to the text from Mark. The father with the, with the son who's possessed by the demon is desperate. It's an awful feeling to be a parent and watch your child go through any kind of sickness, heartache, or pain. I don't think there is any feeling so desperately intense as a parent who cannot help their child. Try and imagine what this father was going through. But then in verse 24 he says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. How many of us can honestly say this when we feel that? This father was honest. He was as honest as in, and sincere, sincere as he could possibly be. Some could criticize him for his lack of faith, but at least he was honest. I have found that before growth can take place, before faith can be increased, before we can make it to the next level, before we can trust enough in God to do the impossible, we've got to be honest with ourselves and with God. Which is the greater sin, faltering in our faith or faking our faith? If the doubts are there, you're not fooling anyone but yourself. Honesty with our doubts can lead us to discovery and greater faith. We need faith in order to see that God can make the impossible possible. 
We need to have faith in what we can't see. I believe what the father in this story is really saying is, I don't understand it all, but I'm willing to learn and hang in there until I do. That's a start of a faith journey. All of us are on different paths on our faith journeys. It doesn't mean that any one of us is a better Christian than the other, as long as we truly believe that we are on the path that God has set for us. We're going to falter from our paths, but we need to keep our faith in Christ and in God that they are there steering us back onto the right path. We are going to stumble, but that doesn't mean we should give up. God delights in increasing the faith of his children. George Mueller said, trials, difficulties, and sometimes defeat are the very food of faith. Doubts cause us to search, and often it leads us to discovery. If we look back on our lives, I believe that we would realize that it was only after a time of questioning and doubt that we grew in faith and understanding. It motivates us to search and explore, pray, study, and at times forces us to trust when we can't see the answer or that it doesn't make any sense. We come away with an even greater faith. So how do you grow faith when everything is fine? It's easy to say, oh Lord, I have great faith in you. It's only when tragedy or heartaches or trials come that we find that our faith and what it is really made of. And like steel being tempered when placed in the fire, it becomes stronger. The good news is that when we face up to our faltering faith, when we admit it, that is when we give God room to do only what he can do, we can see how Jesus handles this later in our same text. So here's what Jesus did not do. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't have enough faith. He didn't say, muster up some more faith and then come back later. He didn't say, a miracle can only happen if you have a certain quota met or a level of faith. No, Jesus went ahead and healed the boy. The impossible becomes possible. Even without the total faith commitment of the Father, or even, in fact, the disciples. All things are possible with God. Today, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ teaches us that even the impossible becomes possible. Maybe in your lifetime, you've seen the impossible become possible. And if not in your lifetime, perhaps in your parents' lifetime. There are many things that were impossible but became possible since the turn of the 1900s. In the early 1900s, nobody thought about flying. It wasn't long from then when the Wright brothers invented the airplane. It wasn't long ago, not even in the 1950s yet, where the people thought about walking on the moon was impossible. Did you ever think you can hold in your hand a device that was more powerful than a computer that can sit on your desktop? Maybe there are many impossible things in your life that you can remember that became possible. Of course, all those examples are just what man can do. Think about what God does and can do. How the Lord easily makes the impossible become possible. We were born into this world as sinners, basically enemies of God. In spite of that fatal flaw, God makes us his children members of his heavenly family. The impossible becomes possible. It is all by God's grace. Paul describes God's grace in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, when he writes, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The impossible becomes possible, not by our works, not by our wealth, but by God's grace. But what do we do when God presents us with a challenge that seems impossible? Has there ever been a time when you've heard the Lord say, 
I want you to be debt free, yet your bills were towering so far above your income, it seemed you could never pay them off? I've heard that calling from God, and I thought it was impossible. But you know, once, what, once I thought it was impossible, he started to show me that I was wrong and that it was possible. It's been tough these last several years for us financially, but he has taught us some wonderful life lessons that are making us better fiscal disciples. We certainly are not debt-free, but we're a lot closer than we were five years ago, and we know our end plan that God has for us and continue to work for that. Has there ever been a time when you heard him say, rise up and be healed, even though doctors were saying you'd never be well again? Well, I was sick, quite sick, a little over two years ago. The doctors weren't saying I'd never be well again, but they really didn't know initially what made me sick. So I had to go into the hospital for a test. While I was there, they gave me some medication that we later found out I was severely allergic to. It landed me in the ICU with a temperature of 105 degrees. The doctors told me that I was just a few minutes from my body starting to shut itself down to save itself. If I had gotten into the ICU about 10 minutes later, my kidneys would have failed. But I truly believe that through the prayers of faith and healing from my wife, my friends, our former pastor, that God did the impossible. He healed me, and the next morning, I was sitting up in the ICU eating breakfast and ready to get back onto my life. God makes the impossible possible. How have you reacted when God has asked you to do the impossible? Do you have enough faith to believe that through him, all things are possible? Be honest with your doubts. It is only when we stop faking and start facing them that we can grow deeper in faith. God is not threatened by your doubts. The church or others around you may feel threatened, but God is not. He openly embraces those with honest doubts that are seeking answers. Come to Jesus and keep your eyes on him. Faith must express itself in communication with God and in personal sacrifice. If we want to do anything significant for God, especially the impossible, we are going to have to be willing to spend time with him and sacrifice some things for him. Prayer is the power grid of faith. Put your eyes on Jesus and not the problem. It's really sad that too often those who do not believe do not pray. Those who do not believe and do not pray most certainly will not fast and deny themselves. Those who falter in prayer life also begin to falter in Bible readings. This affects their spiritual wisdom and their ability to, co to combat temptation. When our spiritual life is weakened, we don't care about spending time in the house of God to worship fellowship, and minister to others. Do you see and understand this self-defeating death spiral? It has a cascading effect. Come to Jesus and keep your eyes on him. When it comes to prayer, some people are very intimidated. I was one of those people. I hated to pray in front of others because there were so many people around me that were so good at it. I was fearful of what others would think about my prayer. I never thought I was any good at praying. Then one day, one of my former pastors, who noticed I was a little uncomfortable at a dinner we were all at, and he looked at me and said, Jeff, why don't you give the prayer? He came to me and he said, you know, God doesn't care how good you or others think that you are when you pray. As long as you pray and you pray from your heart, he hears your message. There's a lot of prayer warriors out there that are great at praying, but it means absolutely nothing because it's not coming from their heart. It's there for show. They want to show everybody what a wonderful prayer warrior there are. That is probably some of the best advice I've ever received in my life. So 
you're like me, don't worry about whether you sound like a prayer warrior or not. Just pray. It powers your faith and helps you believe that the impossible can be possible. So understand that we may have doubts, even in God, when we are in the valley between those mountaintops. This is when it is more important than ever that we put our faith in God because with God, all things are possible. Think back for a few moments over this past year. Can you think of some time when your faith didn't rise to the occasion? Have you discovered some kinks in the armor of your faith? Are there some areas in your life where you haven't been honest with your doubts and you've been faking it? Have you brought it to Jesus and laid it at his feet and said, I believe, but help me in my unbelief? Are you willing to let Jesus take over and grow you to a deeper level as you face and wrestle with your doubts? Are you ready to turn total control over to Jesus? As I said before, God delights in increasing the faith of his children. Maybe what you need to do today is just turn the burdens you are carrying over to God and ask him to help in the areas that you are weak. When you turn it all over, that gives God room to, to work. When the storm has passed, and it will, you can look back and see how you grew in faith and grew closer to God. So let's think back to all the things we've heard over the past several weeks here at the church, where someone has said something that needs done here, but it's impossible. Growing our congregation, that's impossible. We don't have a minister. We've had turmoil. We're floundering financially. We need to get out from under our financial burdens. That's impossible because our congregation isn't growing. Well, there's a circle, right? People are leaving the church. New people aren't coming to the church. We're dwindling our savings quickly. Throw it all out the door. With God, all things are possible. Everybody say that with me. With God, all things are possible. We need to be praying fervently for our church. We need to ask God for his guidance on how best to serve his kingdom through our ministries. We need to have faith that God will provide, and he will. We need to be proactive in listening to what God is telling us. He is telling all of us to get involved, to be invitational, to be spreading the message of his saving grace, to do his will. It is not God's intention for us to have doubts and unbelief. It is certainly not his intention for us to stay there. However, he can use it for good and make us stronger through it. Don't stay in the land of doubt. With God's power, push through to greater faith. God can turn any situation around. We must take his word and apply it to our daily life. You must believe that the word will work for you. You have the mind of Christ. You have the victory. We walk by faith, not by what we see or hear or touch. God is looking for people that are pure in heart. God looks to the man's heart, not his outward appearance. God has forgotten your past sins, so don't hold on to them. God wants to turn the impossible to the possible through Christ Jesus. Prayer, reading of the word, Daily and meditation helps build your faith. Nothing is impossible for God. So one more time, say it with me. Through God, all things are possible. We all need to believe that. We all need to be praying. We need to get involved. And we need to be invitational. Lord, thank you for daily reminding me that everything is possible with you. Thank you for the times that I'm stuck in my valley between the mountaintops, helping to grow my faith. Thank you for the gift of prayer and helping me to understand that it just needs to come from my heart to be important. I know that you can turn any situation around, and I've witnessed that in my own life. Help all of us 
see those times you've turned a situation around in our lives and help us to share that gift with those who don't know you yet. Continue to work with our congregation in fulfilling your kingdom here on earth through our ministries. Teach us all how to be invitational. Keep that small voice inside all of our heads telling us to, con to get involved and to continue to grow that voice until we finally do get involved. It will take all of us here to grow this church and keep our ministries going on. Thank you for understanding when I have doubts and allowing me to be honest with you and helping me to grow from those doubts and struggles. We do walk by faith and not by sight. Teach us to continue that through our lives always. Amen.